Good morning, everyone. My name is Teresa Scandifio. I'm the Director of Adult Learning here at Tiff Bell Lightbox. We are so excited for the start, the launch of what we hope are many panels on archives. Um, we're thrilled to welcome you to our last higher learning event of the fall season. In addition to those joining us in person, we have many others across Canada and beyond joining us via live stream. Thank you to all <laughs> for all of your support on the higher learning program. And also some thank yous to our supporters on behalf of TIFF. I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal, Paris, and Visa, and our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We'd also like to thank donors and members for supporting TIFF's charitable mission of bringing the power of film to life 365 days a year. A few reminders, uh, no photo or video taking is permitted during the event. We do have professional cameras capturing the event and the video will be posted on our higher learning uh, digital resource hub. During the Q&A, we ask that you please uh, line up behind the microphone on the side. This event is live streamed, so we'll also be taking questions via social media using the hashtag RealHeritage. Today's event, Film Archives and Scholarship, is the inaugural event of our Real Heritage Program, an ongoing series of educational sessions dedicated to the access to and management of moving image collections in Ontario and beyond. I love that, Ontario and beyond. Through panel discussions, workshops, film screenings, and networking sessions, the Real Heritage Program will bring together scholars, archivists, filmmakers, curators, and post-secondary students and faculty to examine the opportunities and challenges faced by both large moving image collections and smaller repositories, such as those found in regional archives and small libraries. We're excited to note, uh, to announce that all events as part of the Real Heritage Program will be live streamed at tiff.net slash realheritage. The Real Heritage Program is supported by the Government of Ontario and the Ontario Trillium Foundation. In December, we'll be announcing our Higher Learning Winter Event lineup. The season will start in early January, January with the Canada's Top 10 panel. We'll also be hosting the second installment of our Real Heritage Program in March. Please be sure to sign up for our listserv to receive email alerts about these events. You don't want to miss out. You can sign up online by visiting tiff.net slash higher learning. You can also sign up after the event on, um, with some of the clipboards that will be uh, with our volunteers out, uh, out of the cinema. At the end of September, we proudly announced a new initiative that we are beyond excited about, the Jeffrey and Sandra Lyons Canadian Film Scholarship. The call for applications closes today, and I know that some of you in this crowd applied. Good luck. We're excited to welcome the first recipient of the scholarship in January. We would also like to let you know that tomorrow at 12 p.m., uh, Chris Horak, who's one of our panelists today, will be back to introduce Spartacus as part of our Stanley Kubrick Roundtables and Talks. Tomorrow's screening will be in 70 millimeter. Now, without further delay, please uh, join me in welcoming our moderator for today's panel, the director of our Film Reference Library and Special Collections, Sylvia Frank. If our panelists would like to come up and take their seats. So thank you for coming out today for our first panel. Um, I am the director of the Film Reference Library, uh, which is actually located on the fourth floor of this building. Uh, the library's role is to advance film scholarship through its extensive collections and our staff expertise. Some of you have, may already have been using us um, and accessing our special collections. We have about 85. Some of them are Adam McGoin's archive, David Cronenberg, Bruce McDonald, Patricia Rosema, just to name a few. As Teresa mentioned, um, we have just, we're closing the scholarship today and um, we will be announcing the winner in January. So we're very excited because the scholarship is really intended or was created specifically to promote scholarship using our special collections. So it's a real thrill for me um, because I think so often these wonderful collections are underutilized. So if you've not been able to, if you've not been to the library, please take a chance if you have a moment today and come and visit us. You'll also get to check out part of the Cooper collection. Um, it's attached 
It's part of the library. We have a small gallery in the front of the library. And the Kubrick exhibition is so large uh, that the overflow is with us, and it's free. And it's all his um, unrealized projects, such as Napoleon, his research, his lenses, and his cameras. It's really quite wonderful. And staff are happy to give anyone a little behind the scenes tour today. Um, the aim of today's session is really to illustrate the richness of archives, the different uses for the treasures housed within them, and the many sectors and professions that interact with them. So after the panel, you'll have lots of time to talk to our experts, and I really hope you take the opportunity to engage with them. One of our panelists could not make it today for unforeseen circumstances. Um, that was Elizabeth Plink, who's a visual researcher. But we have three very, very great experts here. And this way, they all have a little extra time. Our first speaker is Chris Horak. He's been the director of UCLA Film and Television Archive and professor for critical studies since 2007. He was previously the, di the director of archives and collections at Universal Studios, director of the Munich Film Museum, and senior curator at George Eastman House. His book publications include Film and Photo in the 1920s, Helmar Lasky, Pioneer of Israeli Cinema, Lovers of Cinema, the, American, the First American Film Avant-Garde, 1919 to 1945, and he's just recently published Da, 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 da. <laughs> Saul Bass, Anatomy of Film Design, put out by the University Press of Kentucky. It's just come out. Our second speaker is going to be Ron Mann. He's one of Canada's foremost documentary filmmakers. He established his reputation while in his 20s with a series of award-winning theatrical documentaries, including Imagine the Sound in 1981, Poetry in Motion 1982, Comic Book Confidential, 1988, Twist in 1992, and Grass, 1999. He has completed production on his newest film, Altman, a feature-length documentary based on the life and art of Robert Altman. And in 2002, Ron also founded a distribution company, company called Films We Like, and it's a boutique distributor of documentary, independent, and international films in Canada. And our last panelist is Janine Merchassot, and she is a professor of cinema and media studies at York University, and she holds the Canada Research Chair in Art, Digital Media, and Globalization. Among numerous initiatives, she directs a visible city project and an online archive that unites over 50 interviews with artists, urban planners, designers, and curators from a variety of countries. Over the past two decades, Janine has worked with a curatorial collective public access to investigate new models of urban public art, including the Leona Drive Project 2009, Museum for the End of the World 2012, and Landslide Possible Futures. She also has a new book, <laughs> Reimagining Cinema, Film and Expo 67, and she co-edited with Monica Kin Gagnon, and it was just published earlier this week. So welcome, panelists. So Chris, if you'd like to come up and give your presentation. So good morning. Uh, thank you for all for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the LA Rebellion, which was uh, a, a name we gave to a group of African American film students uh, who were the first generation of, of uh, students of color at UCLA in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s, uh, many of whom then went on to careers as independent filmmakers. Uh, I need mention only Charles Burnett and his film Killer of Sheep, uh, Julie Dash and uh, Daughter of the Dust, um, Billy Woodbury and his film Bless Their Little Hearts, um, and numerous others that I will be talking about. Um, 
We started this project because in Los Angeles, the Getty uh, Foundation uh, decided to do this mass um, exhibition funding a, a, finally a total of 50 different museums and archive on the archives on the topics of uh, post-war art in Los Angeles. And so um, we decided to do something on the LA Rebellion. Um, I had actually met Billy Woodbury 30 years earlier in Berlin at the Berlin Film Festival when he had first shown uh, Bless Their Little Hearts and we had stayed in touch. Um, but uh, this project turned out to be much larger and more interesting than we thought, uh, because we initially thought, well, we just have to bring the films together and then we'll show them. Well, it wasn't so easy. First of all, um, we had a research phase where it turned out instead of having only about eight or 10 filmmakers, we eventually identified approximately 50 different filmmakers a number of whom, d of course, did not go on to careers in film, uh, uh, long careers in filmmaking, but did make films. Uh, secondly, because these were uh, members of a minority uh, and their films were independent, uh, there were serious issues, and in many cases, the films had been lost. Um, very few of the films had been in distribution, and the group itself was not exactly excited that when we came to them and said we want to do this because at the time in the, uh, when they were at UCLA there was still a lot of racism among the at the all white professorship and so they really saw their time at UCLA as one where um, they had they got an infrastructure to make films in spite of the professorship and so I remember talking to Haile Garima, another member of the group who, uh, uh, who was from Ethiopia, and he says to me, who the fuck are you? <laughs> like, uh, you know, I'm not interested. So it, it really took we, uh, quite a while to get them engaged and to really um, have them accept the fact that we were serious and that we really wanted to do stuff. So um, after an initial phase of of, of research, we then started uh, looking for the films and um, realized that, again, uh, few of the films were in distribution. In fact, uh, most of them had not been in distribution. And because these filmmakers were living economically, there were many of them were either middle class or lower middle class, so they didn't really have money to, to, to do any work on their films, and, uh, and they moved around a lot. So we'd hear, well, uh, the film may be in Memphis in a lab, or it may be somewhere else, or it was completely lost. And in some cases, even, um, we found out that, uh, well, in one case, uh, a, uh, a woman filmmaker uh, named Malvona Ballinger, that her film had uh, had actually, that she had passed away and all of her stuff had been thrown out into the street. And so um, there were challenges. Of the, of the 73 films and videos we eventually uh, identified as LA Rebellion titles, only 28 or only 39% had ever been in distribution and mostly at the time and by the, by the turn of the century, um, virtually none of these films were in distribution. So the, the uh, preservation situation was, was quite difficult. Um, as happens with a lot of independent filmmakers, there was also the issue that, you know, the labs have been closing continuously for the last 20 years and uh, the, the analog film labs have been closing, and, and often uh, the films would just be thrown in the trash. So we'd find out that the film, that while well, it was in the lab, but the lab had disappeared. Um, happily, um, we did have uh, a team that would not give up, and uh, we actually found several films with that where the filmmaker had not only thought they were lost, but uh, 
had actually buried the film. So Larry Clark, one of our filmmakers, who made a beautiful film called Passing Through, uh, had, 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 made an, had made an earlier film, sorry, had made an earlier film um, called uh, As Above and So Below, and so he, he was not completely happy with this film, so he thought he would, could bury it and nobody would ever see it again. Well, uh, we found it, and uh, we found the original uh, negatives, uh, A, the A and B rolls, and we then remade a new, we made a new print from those uh, A and B rolls, and it turned out to be one of the most interesting films in the, in the program. It was made in 73, and it was uh, really a film very much uh, about black power and black revolution. It's a, a, a soldier who comes back from Vietnam and becomes a revolutionary, and uh, when we finally saw this film, we were really bowled over by it. Um, uh, in another case, uh, Jama Fanaka, who is also a member of the group, who's most famous for a film, for a, uh, three films uh, that were more uh, commercial, called Penitentiary One and Two and Three, uh, and that were sold at the time in the mid to late seventies as black exploitation films, even though they are much more than that. Uh, he had made a short film uh, previous to that at UCLA called One Day in the Life of Willie Faust. It's all of these students in their first semester, or first quarter at UCLA had to do a so-called Project One, which was an eight millimeter film that uh, they would have to do as, a, as an exercise. And so um, I spent about eight hours uh, in Compton in a shed in one of these areas where, you know, storage units, uh, digging through all of his stuff that he had stored there in 90 degree heat. And um, by four, we went, got there, I don't know, it's something like nine in the morning, and at four in the afternoon, I found the film in the dirt at the very bottom and back of the shed, the only surviving print of this film. So uh, that film, like a number of the other films, um, because it was eight millimeter, we then uh, transferred to digital and, and showed that film. And it was, it, it was actually a, it's one day in the life of Willie Faust, a Faust story about a drug addict who, uh, who buys it at the end. So um, after uh, we started working on this, then uh, it, it, uh, it became clear more and more of the filmmakers uh, started to get with the program and understand that we're, what we were doing. Uh, even Haile Garima, when we when we opened up uh, our first show, we opened with Daughters of the Dust, which was another problem. I'll tell, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, he, uh, he called me up afterwards and uh, he had liked my talk because what I had said was that, you know, the, um, it's, it's unfortunate that UCLA as a white institution had to be doing this and because there was no archive anywhere in the United States dedicated to African American film. And if, uh, if we, we were, uh, we were still, there were still elements of racism in our society and therefore uh, that hindered this, this kind of activity that, that you would have an institution dedicated only to African American film. Um, uh, in another film, uh, as I said, that we worked on was a film called Rain, uh, Malvona Ballinger's uh, thesis film, a beautiful, beautiful film, and for the longest time we couldn't find it, and we finally, amazingly enough, in our own archive, found a, um, this, is, this is happens all the time, films get misidentified when you have 350,000 titles in your collection as we do. We are the second largest uh, film and television archive in the United States. Think that these kinds of things do go missing. But this, uh, what we had of Rain was a three quarter inch transfer uh, telecined of a 
used work print. That's all we had. And so um, we took that three quarter inch, we digitized it, and we spent a lot of time doing digital cleanup to get something out of it because, it, like I said, it, was, it turned out to be really a very beautiful film. By the way, three quarter inch tape is I extremely fragile and um, and now the only way to get a transfer from three quarter inch often from tapes from the 70s and 80s is to bake them. And in fact, that's what we did with this three quarter inch tape. We baked it for about an hour at a specific temperature and then you get one pass through the digitizer and if you mess that up, then it's usually over because what happens is the, uh, the oxide on the tape begins to flake off after it passes over the head. So um, it's a terrible problem and a problem we're facing all the time. I think we have t tens of thousands of three-quarter inch tapes because that was a, a medium of choice for, for analog video in, in that time period. And, uh, how we're all going to get them transferred, I don't know. Um, in another case, uh, Bernard Nichols, uh, Nicholas uh, had taken all of his films and he had transferred them to, uh, to digital in a, uh, but in low resolution. So he had DVDs of them and then he had thrown away the films. So that, that was unfortunate because we then had to try to take these DVDs and up-res them to get a decent image that you could, you could throw up on a screen. Um, anyway, so this whole preservation project ended up taking uh, several years before uh, we could actually do the program. In other cases where we did have materials, uh, we had material on Super 8, we had material on 8 millimeter, on, as I said, 3 quarter inch, quarter inch, even on VHS, um, as well as 35 and 16 millimeter. And in a number of cases, we actually went and took the 16 millimeter A and B rolls and, um, okay, and uh, blew them up to 35 because. Um, 16 millimeter again is a now a, a virtually dead format and in order to be able to show these films theatrically uh, we blew them up to 35. We did that with uh, Charles Burnett's Killer of Sheep um, with, um, and with Larry Clark's Passing Through and with Barbara McCullough who was a, a more experimental filmmaker. She made a film called Water Ritual Number One, 1980, and uh, we blew that to 35, as well as Billy Woodbury's first feature, Bless the Little Hearts, and his short, The Pocketbook. In the case of Daughters of the Dust, which, like Killer of Sheep, is a film on the National Registry, um, the film had been in continuous distribution, um, and we then wanted it, so there were no good prints, they were all pretty beat up and we wanted to make a new print and then found out from the lab that she, uh, Julie Dash had never paid, she had gotten into some fight with the lab and over, over costs and so all the prints and they had made something like 20 prints off this film had only been made off the first answer print. In other words, they had never made a correctly timed print. Uh, and it was in distribution all those years. So I went to the lab. Um, I, I knew the, the, the guy that ran the lab. Well, um, and um, finally, I ended up paying, not I, the archive ended up paying the debts. And uh, we, for the first time, produced a correctly timed second answer print, which we premiered. And AJ, the cameraman, and Julie were at the screening and they, they were literally weeping because they couldn't believe how beautiful the film looked once th it was correctly timed because previously, like, to that it had been never seen. Anyway, um, the program played in Los Angeles um, in the fall of 2011 and then actually went on tour uh, to about 10 different cities around the country. And uh, we did a catalog, which I've been showing you, slides of, not really, but 
uh, you can see part of the program. And, um, and now a book is going to be coming out that I and um, my two uh, uh, co-curators had done um, and worked on, and that's coming out at UC Press hopefully sometime next year. So uh, that, that's the short version of the LA Rebellion. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Ron Mann. He's going to talk about his film Altman and the archives he used. <laughs> How does this work, Sylvia? <laughs> <laughs> And <laughs> sorry, <coughs> teenager around. Um, oh, okay. I just want to check this out to see if it works. Um, so far, what if I did this? No, okay. <laughs> Don't Here touch our button. Oh, perfect. Okay, that that that's good. You want me to the stay? Return. No, 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 no. <laughs> Hold my hand. Um, <laughs> Um, my mentor was Emile D'Antonio. He was a political documentary filmmaker who made Millhouse in the Year of the Pig, Point of Order, and other compilation films using historical archival material. He was inspired by painters, painters like um, Rauschenberg, um, and uh, music by uh, John Cage, for example. Uh, D was a really good friend of, of John Cage, um, and uh, produced uh, one of his one of his concerts. Actually, um, I um, I was inspired by D's films to make documentaries, and um, I started off making performance documentaries, and then eventually um, on a film called Com Confidential, started to. Um, um, incorporate historical materials into my films. Um, the f that film, Grass, Dream Tower, Twist, um, were all um, a strand of filmmaking, which is very, very difficult to do. <laughs> um, it's kind of, um, it, it, but it's the most satisfying in a way because um, you work with um, uh, material, I mean, I'm a closet archivist. I, I could spend my time um, in a library just going over historical materials. Um, D once said that um, the history, our history, is in the our uh, basements of television stations, and in their art and in their outtakes. <clears throat> um, for the film Altman, I wasn't intending on making a film about. Um, uh, oh sorry, uh, making a, a compilation film. Actually, the film was uh, inspired by a book uh, by Mitchell Zukoff called Altman, which is an oral history. And I had thought of the film originally as a film that would be um, interviews. Um, but And I actually didn't know that Bob had left a, um, an archive. Um, when I first met Catherine Altman, <clears throat> she asked me what kind of film did I want to do, and I said, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> Matthew Sieg, um, who was a, um, the uh, uh, producer of, of Bob's, told me about um, a collection that Bob had don gifted to the University of Michigan, um, to the Hatcher Library in Ann Arbor. And so I um, thought I'd take a friend and go to the, um, oh, thanks, <laughs> that's so sweet. Um, um, <clears throat> I thought I would go just for a week, and I wound up staying all summer. Um, this, is <laughs> this is my friend, Max, <clears throat> one of, one, the first research assistant <laughs> when we drove to the University of Ann, uh, Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, and um, he looked pretty happy there. <laughs> But at the end of the summer, I'm not so sure. Uh, we added on uh, we <laughs> we added on six assistants by the end of it because Bob had had really left um, 
from every production, um, even going back to his, his war days, a, a, what, I, what I've never seen a more extensive collection. If you think of the last shot in Raiders of the Last of Lost Ark, that scene with all those boxes it was kind of like that. But what was most amazing was that the Hatcher Library, this was three years prior to um, this. This is our first day, actually. Um, the um, Hatcher Library had organized the collection into a finding aid. Um, this, there's some of the boxes that you would call up. <clears throat> and I would go through every one of these boxes, and they were divided by um, um, uh, per project. So when I got there, I was the first person to actually use this collection after it was organized three years by the most, uh, you know, most amazing um, librarians I had ever enc uh, encountered. Um, and um, the way this collection uh, was organized was by through different projects and through business, um, records, personal um, records. They also have about 300 um, um, artifacts that were gifted. Um, I'm going to go through the indexing of this. As you can see, that was the top sheet. This is um, this would tell you exactly what is in each one of these boxes. And what I was really after were two things. One was where um, photographs. Um, these, this was unit photography of of all of his um, film shoots. But also, I was interested in knowing where he went for interviews to look for audiovisual um, material. And so what I would do is I would go through um, not only the, the slides, which I'll talk about, and the, and the, um, the, the, um, the, the um, unit photography, but also the, um, uh, the, record, the office records that showed at the end of a production, he would do interviews to promote his, his films. And um, the lectures that he did in the workshops and, and the film festivals and so on. And I would t catalog all of that information and then contact, you know, the source of where he went. For example, Bob in 2003 was um, a maverick at the Toronto International Festival. So I contacted the, the um, Sylvia, and, we, and there was an hour um, um, uh, film, or sorry, a tape of the Maverick session with Bob. Um, okay, so PR schedule. Oh, so this is Gosford Park. So this would have been one of Bob's uh, films and um <coughs> how he would be um, the day of his interviews, and then I would contact all these different sources. Um, what the heck is that? Uh, I think it's just more. Um, that would have been the player, though. Um, this, this would have been, um, let's go through here. OK, so here's some of the photographs that we had found. Um, there were personal photographs. Um, and the difference here is, um, the, the way I'm, a, I'm able to kind of manipulate this, the material now digitally through After Effects. So if you had a, a photograph from, uh, uh, oh, see, uh, when you, um, now in digital, you can actually blow up images the size of the screen, and that, image could possibly, in fact, I think it is, was actually one inch by one inch. So it would have been uh, impossible. Uh, when I made a film, when I made the comic book film, for example, all the animation was done on an Oxbury, and it was flat out on animation. But now digitally, you can actually take um, one of the unit photography sheets, and which would have about 30 photographs on it, and scan it. Um, at high res and then um, blow it up to this size. I went through 
I can't remember, hundreds of thousands of photographs and curated it down to 15 scanned um, images um, all summer uh, between 10 o'clock and 5 o'clock with a 15 minute break. Um, and, um, and these were all typically one inch by one inch photographs. <coughs> this is a shot of um, Bob on the set of Three Women. Um, so just using Three Women as an example, the archive would have every, um, I don't know, uh, from development to the final uh, release of the film would have every stage documented within this collection. Um, so this would be the script. Um, this would have been what they found when they were, lo were on location scouting um, in Palm Springs, because um, Bob was, um, that's where the film was shot. This is Stephen Altman on the set. Um, this is one of the first films that Stephen worked on. He was an art director on many films, uh, Gosford Park. Um, so this is, this is an example of what I would be scanning wide and then um, look at, um <coughs> I would identify a certain photograph and then blow it up to that size digitally. Um, so <coughs> the amount of material that I'm going through is um, um, twice, you know, it's, there's a lot. <laughs> um, this is a film, by the way, I actually saw, I, I wrote a college paper on. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite films of Bob's. Um, and so the, I was actually in Cannes for the premiere of that film. Uh, Catherine's on its side and on the side there, anyway. And there I am in the, <laughs> the University of Ann Arbor. Um, there, the other uh, research that I did was uh, for audiovisual material. Um, Bob's archive is held at the uh, UCLA at the uh, Film and Television Archive, which holds all the film elements. And um, so I worked with, um, Chris mentioned um, the, uh, the cans that weren't identified. I actually went into the, the, the vaults and found cans that just said Brewster McLeod, but I knew it was, um, you know, it was a short sort of film. And so we put it up on a telecine carefully and um, identified it as just behind the scenes material that, um, that people had never seen. It was just someone had just shot it. Um, so I, I actually did a lot of detective work with the help of the staff of UCLA. Um, after all of this, I asked Catherine um, if she had any um, material, and she had actually kept from the time that she had met Bob about 25 volumes that she had put together of her personal photographs and Super 8 film that they had. And I'm going to show you an example of one of the Super 8 films that I had digitally transferred that um, wound up in, um, up in the film. Hello, oh. is your name Mrs. Oh, they didn't show the Super 8 clip. Oh well, that's uh, but anyway, that is that act that clip came from um, a, fi a film called Images that was uh, filmed behind the scenes um, on a film in Ireland for the film Images. Um, anyway, you could see the film <laughs> and, uh, and see it. It's and it's a compilation film, so. Um, Happy to talk to you afterwards <laughs> about it. <laughs> Thank you. 
And our next speaker that we want to welcome is Janine Meshasso from uh, York University. Janine, do you want to come up? I think we'll do Karen. Great. Well, I'd like to. Um, Thank the uh, organizers, uh, Sylvia Frank and uh, Teresa Scandifio, for inviting me to be part of this, uh, this exciting panel. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'm, I'm skipping right to uh, two projects that, uh, that I've been involved with for the past uh, five years. Um, I guess my role on the panel is to talk about uh, ephemeral uh, archives, informal archives, invisible archives, um, and the process of activating archives, although both my panelists have been activating archives. Um, and uh, what I've been doing uh, is uh, I've been involved in curating public art exhibitions uh, that, um, that involve embedding archives in architectural public spaces. Um, and uh, for th in terms of my own work, I've, I've been studying cities uh, for, for a while and thinking about the way that artists uh, animate, redesign our experience of cities. But I've also been concerned with the way that cities are developing. Um, and so uh, I've been studying urban sprawl and thinking about all the things that we all think about, sustainability. Uh, and so my two interests in public art and in the life of cities uh, came together with these two public art exhibitions. Um, I was working at York University with a very talented group of artists and graduate students, and we were looking at the way that the city was changing and, and developing. And so we chose to, um, to set up a case study in Willowdale, uh, which is a suburb in the north of Toronto. And we started to walk around Willowdale to understand how Willowdale was changing very, very quickly. Um, and street upon street upon street, we would come across these rows of houses um, that were boarded up and that were simply uh, had been bought up by a developer and were waiting uh, for zoning applications to come through. Um, this was 2009 and there was a huge economic crisis on and so a lot of the development had been stalled and we took advantage of that to contact the municipal councillor, John Fillion, and ask him to connect us with a developer so that we could gain access to some of these boarded up houses and stage uh, a, a kind of crazy public art project um, that would treat the houses themselves as these these archives. Um, so uh, to our surprise, one of the developers uh, who actually thought we were uh, working with, um, with a high school and so thought it was simply a high school project, so it seemed pretty innocent, allowed us access uh, to six of, the, six of the houses. You can see this is an aerial uh, view uh, for, a, for a period very brief uh, of 10 days. So 23 artists were invited to essentially intervene uh, in these houses and um, to uh, come, it was kind of like a vivisection section, to come at these houses uh, from all different directions. Um, so it was, uh, it, it was a very novelistic kind of project, but for, for our purposes, um, the houses uh, became these living archives. Um, and a, a number of the artists did uh, a lot of historical research, uh, went to the uh, City of Toronto archives, went to a number of libraries, and found out the, the history of these houses and the history of the area. So this is vernacular, really vernacular and very micrological uh, history, but so um, so in incredibly fascinating. We, we learned that the uh, the Wright family who owned the the lots in uh, 1910 had named all of the streets in the area after their children. But Leona Drive, which was the street that we were working on, was the only one uh, whose name could not be placed. So she is forever uh, a mystery. Um, so we wanted to. Uh, 
both maintain the, the structure of the houses um, as well as dig up some original material and try to, to meld the two. We were very much inspired by the architectural uh, theorist Siegfried Gideon, who um, talked about this concept of anonymous history. Anonymous history is that history that's embedded in objects that surround us, uh, but things that are made by craftspeople, things that are made by unknown engineers. And we felt that these houses themselves had that kind of anonymity, so we wanted to uh, dig up these anonymous uh, people that were involved in the design, but also the lives that were lived. So we, um, we ended up uh, doing lots of interviews with uh, people that had lived uh, in the houses, many women in their 80s who had raised their children who still lived in the area. Um, the, the one house that we worked in, in detail belonged to Ruth Gillespie who had died very suddenly on a dance floor at the age of 80. Uh, the developer had bought up the house and uh, left all of her things in the basement. So two of the artists, Angela Jossie and uh, Shannon McDonald, actually made an installation out of her things, which were uh, a high school yearbook from the 1950s, tax returns, a recipe book. Um, they ended up, um, in order to uh, get, in the get into the structure of feeling of uh, Ruth Gillespie's uh, informal archive, um, they ended up making one of the recipes in her recipe book, and then that turned into a projection. Um, which you just saw, and um, the, the, the exhibition lasted, as I said, 10 days, very, very brief, but got a lot of press, and a lot of people came, people who uh, knew people who used to live in the houses, people that were connected in some way to the, the area, the residents uh, took over uh, the exhibition, uh, and, and then people who had nothing to do with it, but who, are, who were interested in the, in the project. And then Ruth Gillespie's niece ended up coming and reclaiming her things. Um, I don't want to run out of time, so just very quickly, another uh, project uh, that was really an archival uh, project by uh, Stephen Logan and Boyana Vadikunik um, created maps uh, from the area. They found a treasure trove of photographs by Ted Chernside, who was a resident of the area. This was at the library, who had been taking, uh, who had been documenting the development in that area, which is uh, just Shepherd and Young, for over 50 years. So an incredibly rich visual archive of uh, development. Um, they, I'm not going to show this clip, but this group, um, Stephen and Boyana, were, they had the most empirical evidence of uh, Leona Drive, but they were not satisfied with that and ended up bringing in a medium, uh, psychic, t into the house, uh, and the psychic channeled uh, Ruth Gillespie in order really to get close, or as close as possible, um, to the feeling of, um, of the house. So what, what I think the exhibition accomplished uh, was to uh, just present a pause in the processes of development and to link development with history, um, to understand that sustainability, we're talking about sustainability in the context of climate change, actually needs to uh, connect to history and history in a very pluralistic way. So I'm going to jump Oh, oh yeah, the end of the story is the houses were demolished and replaced with big monster houses, and that's, that's it. Um, the, the next project, which I was involved with a few years later, very much inspired by Leona Drive, uh, took place in uh, Markham, Ontario, to further, even further north, uh, and it was a collaboration with the Markham Museum and Collections Building, and uh, the Markham Museum is an open-air museum. It is um, a heritage village, although uh, Kathy Malloy, the director, who is fantastic for us, has asked me con continuously not to call it a heritage village. So I won't. <laughs> That's that. So um, heritage villages are very weird spaces. So this is another kind of virtual space like Leona Drive. Um, they're... Uh, they're, they're, they're Disneyland spaces. They, these uh, houses were uh, moved from the area because of development as the subdivisions uh, multiplied and multiplied. These, these houses are sort of like survivalist, uh, you know, it's a survivalist camp of, of a variety of, of different houses. 
Um, the design is, is, of course, very curious. It's a village that resembles, mirrors the subdivision in which it is located. And this is actually very common in Canada. Heritage villages generally located outside of, on the peripheries of suburbs, and are there to mirror the very structure of the suburb as a kind of reassuring anchor. So heritage itself has to be problematized. Uh, the uh, political theorist David Harvey reminds us that heritage is history in the present. It is, um, it is always a political and powerful tool. Certain things get preserved, other things do not. So we were really interested in what was not uh, preserved. Um, we had a number of uh, indigenous and uh, Métis artists come in and produce uh, a variety of different projects. That museum actually had, um, there were no uh, indigenous um, artifacts on view, um, so some of the artists went in and actually excavated uh, some of those things. Um, we also had a number of artists uh, come in and, and embed vernacular uh, history, so I'm just going to end by mentioning two. Uh, Jenny Suttick, um, who is a Toronto artist, grew up in Markham, and um, she actually approached me when she found out about the project and uh, essentially said, I have I have to be in this show. And, and what she um, proposed was her bedroom. Um, she had an archive. It was uh, her bedroom. Uh, uh, she lived with her parents until she was about 19. And they had not changed her bedroom. So her bedroom was like a museum. Uh, you know, a 10 years in the life of a girl growing up in Markham. And so that's what she recreated through uh, projections and, um, and artifacts. She also, um, because she's, she has also seen the incredible changes that Markham has gone through, she also interviewed old timers, people that grew up in Markham about their memories of, of walking. And, and many of the walks, of course, no longer exist because they've been replaced by subdivisions. Uh, the landscape itself, which is, of course, an archive, has been completely transformed by development, development layers, uh, layers, land, levels, land, uh, sorry, and, uh, and, and so things get flattened out, and so she wanted to bring a bit of the dimension back. Um, and the last project I want to mention is a project by uh, filmmaker Philip Hoffman, who didn't grow up in Markham, but grew up in uh, Kitchener. Um, and he, for, for many years as a teenager, worked at the uh, family uh, plant, the meat plant uh, at Hoffman Meats, and so he, uh, the artists were allowed to choose a house, and so he, uh, uh, we thought perversely, chose the slaughterhouse, and we were afraid of what he was going to do, but what he did was, was actually I incredibly fascinating. He, um, he embedded uh, seven different kinds of ar archival materials inside of the house. I'm going to show the clip. Um, maybe, uh, so, so uh, the arch archive materials from his, from the family uh, archive, an interview with his father um, that essentially documented the growth of the family business and also the way it was bought up by Canada Packers. So kind of documenting the industrialization of, of food production. He also interviewed, um, an, uh, a, a number of farmers about uh, and organic farmers about food so production in Ontario, is that, um, that basically and about a particular farmers, way of conceptualizing farmers the land. leaving the land because so, they um, cannot. This this project can only be accessed by looking into the knot in and the then in the building. You can never get a total vision down, of the of the archive. Just which, little which bits and pieces with a lot of, of history. With a lot of in the last. Hard work um, and sweat, but maybe the other the archival moment. material that's very important is um, one that he had been developing on the Ojibwe land rights activist Nani uh, Buikwat, who had uh, been fighting to have her her land and the land of her people uh, restored. So it was a it was a very layered uh, project that I thought beautifully uh, told the uh, the story of uh, of Southern Ontario um, through these multiple a multiplicity of perspectives. I think that's it. Thank you. Wow.
Wow, that was stimulating. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think you can see that uh, by the presentations, uh, we've <laughs> certainly seen the many different ways that archives can be utilized and why they're so integral to our cultural landscape. Um, to kick off the Q&A, I have a question for the panel. Um, I'll start with Chris. I'd really like to know what attracted you to the current field that you're in. To um, it was actually by accident. Um, I, I, I started out as a filmmaker. I got a master's at Boston University and um, then was doing a, a, an oral history project out in California and uh, I got a call from George Eastman House and they said, do you want to come and be an intern? Uh, because, and they offered me a postgraduate internship in archiving. And that had come about because my thesis advisor was Professor Evan Cameron, who uh, was uh, now recently retired from York here in Toronto. He's spent many years here. And um, even when I, when I was in film school, I kind of knew I went to film school not to become a filmmaker, but to actually become a film critic. And so, uh, but I wanted to learn about film. And so at one point he had asked me, you know, we, uh, I was taking the course theory of film production and he said, well, why don't you write a paper about nitrate film, which I did. And so he had done a, a symposium at Eastman House and so they called him because they had gone through a huge application process and they had chosen someone who at the last minute decided to go to the Folger, Shakespeare Folger Library in Washington and they didn't have a candidate. So he suggested me and that's how I ended up at Eastman House and now, I hate to say it, almost 40 years later, I'm still in the field. Thank you. <laughs> Ron, can I ask you the same question? Wait, what was the question? <laughs> Wait, how I, it's how too I got inspired by <laughs> Yes. Well, um, there, there's a, okay. Um, there's a, um, a fan, I'm a fan of uh, Eric Dolphy, and at the end of Eric Dolphy's album, Last Date, there he says this line, music's in the air and it's gone. And uh, it made me really think about um, ephemeral culture. Um, I went to see uh, Rassan Roland Kirk at the University of Massachusetts, and I wanted to make a movie about him. He had just um, um, uh, came out of a stroke, so he was playing with half of his body paralyzed. And uh, six months later, he died. Um, and I thought, well, um, uh, there's, and there wasn't much of a record of, of Rassan's uh, work at the time. Now, now actually there's a fantastic um, film out um, that has collected from archives all over the world, um, gr the great footage of Rassan. But if you look at Charlie Parker, for example, there's just, you know, seconds of Parker's, Parker on camera. So um, that sort of made me think about documenting um, sort of what I really loved. D'Antonio said there are only two reasons for making any film. You love something intensely or you dislike something intensely. And I liked, um, I liked um, a, lot, a lot of things. Um, on in there's, I, I actually started making films not for um, the present, but for the future. So on a film like Poetry in Motion, I had filmed hundreds of poets at the time um, and as an archival record of, of documenting um, people like Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs and Charles Bukowski and others, John Cage. And um, the movie, I thought, was just a vessel. Like it was 90 minutes of, of, of just one part of 
the, the project, which was really the, the 75 hours that I had filmed at the time. And so I started thinking that really early on in terms of um, there should be a record of our history. In other words, our history uh, is an audiovisual history. If it isn't filmed or documented, it's like it didn't happen. Um, on a film about rock and roll dance, for example, there's very little of African American dance in clubs in the 50s, whereas there is mass amount of Dick Clark bandstand kind of footage. And so um, I sort of took it on as a cultural historian, a, a cultural historian's approach to filmmaking. Um, D'Antonio's films aesthetic as collage really appealed to me. Um, although um, <laughs> it's just, it's insanely difficult and I'm so glad to work with Robert Kennedy who's an incredible editor who I've worked with for many, many years where we would sit and actually create the film in the editing room and let that material come out of it. I started to also get um, very proactive in terms of working with um, historical mar materials and preserving them. And since 1995, I have put together um, archives of filmmakers, artists, um, musicians, and organizing their collections to gift into institutions in Canada um, and major companies that, are, that don't exist anymore wh who were throwing out their materials. Um, and those were gifted um, from the Pacific Archives of Nova Scotia to UBC, right across Canada. And I'm still active in that way and I really care about preservation. I think libraries are sacred spaces, actually, um, and should be preserved, th and, this, and the people that are in them are saints. <laughs> um, I, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, 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 my eye is also, f whenever I look at historical materials, I just can't turn, I can't turn away from them. I'm just fascinated by them. And um, because they're just the record of our time. So I, I just, uh, for me, I, um, those kinds of films also really I'm attracted to. Do you know one of our funders calls us the monks of, of film <laughs> preservation? <laughs> Janine, can you give us a, a response as well? Yes. Um, so, well, my uh, dissertation uh, supervisor was the uh, late uh, uh, Canadian archivist Peter Morris. So um, he really, uh, he is the author of Embattled uh, Shadows, very, very important uh, book for uh, Canadian film. So he really inspired a love of archives in me. And my, my, my work has always been uh, engaged with archives in some way. But I have to say that the, um, the past, uh, since 2009, I've had a different relationship to archives with, with two projects. One, the Leona Drive project that, you just, that I just talked about. Um, and the other one is the Expo 67 uh, project that um, has just come out as a, as a book. And just the, you know, um, I was working with uh, Seth Feldman and, and Monique Gagnon uh, at Concordia University, York University. And, and we thought we, we got a grant to study the films of Expo 67, and, and so we just thought we'd go to the archive and just study them. But it um, turned out that the films of Expo 67 don't, are they're, they're nowhere, they're lost. They're, you know, because they were made for this ephemeral event, they were made for multiple screens, they were experimental. But also, once uh, Expo closed, nobody thought to put these things in a safe place. So we spent, uh, you know, we spent the past five years really digging and uh, pu putting together a, a puzzle, um, and through interviews and photographs and blueprints and um, and you know the the same happened with with the Leona Drive project is kind of piecing things together and I just became fascinated with um, these ephemeral um, and informal 
archives, but also with formal archives. Uh, I think archives are, they, they are, as I said, connected to the future. We have to think uh, in terms of the past, which is, which is not fixed. Can I elaborate on my answer just a little bit? Yes. <laughs> I guess what I wanted to say is that what has, the reason I've loved working in archives is once, once I got into it is that um, I'm also, I also teach, uh, I'm a professor, but working in an archive is a different kind of pedagogy than it is just working with students because you're working with, uh, you're doing things for the public at large and it, it's, in, in one ways it's more general because it has to be, it has to speak to everyone no matter what their education level. On the other hand, it is in some ways a lot more satisfying when you do a project, when you, uh, and I've always been interested in not just being a, a caretaker of, of materials but also doing research and, and, and organizing that material. And so when we did the Elder Rebellion, it was, it was, uh, it was such a great project because we were bringing something back to life that not only uh, the, the material was, it, there was no conscious or very little consciousness about this, but we were dealing with living filmmakers. So usually I'm dealing with dead filmmakers because they're long gone and the films are from the silent era. But here we were able to work with living filmmakers and uh, we did a, a, a symposium right at the beginning of it, and it was, we had about 20 of the filmmakers there, and they were just so grateful because they, we were literally resurrecting their work when they had, had been forgotten. And that was, it was just, uh, I mean, I can't tell you the emotions that we all felt in, in, in the process of doing that and bringing that to a larger public, and then now, you know, in fact, I just got a call last week. It looks like our show is going to go to the Tate in London now. And so it's just knowing that, that, that these filmmakers are, and that, and the other thing I, uh, I did is we, we, we did get a lot of grant money and we made sure we paid the filmmakers every step of the way for their appearances, for all of the, every time the films were shown, because many of these filmmakers had never made a penny off of their films. And so this was a way for us to, to pay back to them, you know, and make up for some of the things they had experienced, the negative things they had experienced when they were actually students at UCLA. Thanks, Chris. We're going to turn it over to the audience now. Um, please step down to the microphone. Thanks, so we can capture. I want to thank all three for this, um, and Sylvia for this wonderful panel. It's so incredibly rich. I don't really have a question to ask you. I just, I just want to say the the range of this, um, the presentations is wonderful because um, Professor Horak, I'm sorry, I don't remember your first name, uh, talked about the actual Chris, Chris um, the material difficulties of preserving and finding and so on. Uh, I think this is wonderful. Next time, I think you should turn your attention to women's films. There is a huge uh, movement of getting finding films from the silent era, but films from the 70s are gone. The, the women's films, they're not anywhere. And um, we're going to be sp having another huge archival project about that any day now. Ron talked about the difficulties of working with an enormous archive that was there, which is really wonderful. And Janine, with her ephemeral material, I thought the girl's bedroom was such a wonderful example of, <laughs> of this. The kinds of things that aren't generally preserved in an archive that can be lost so easily. And I, I also wanted to mention the, the, in the Leona Drive project, the one that I loved, the 
in a way the most, although all the houses were really rich in their installations, was the one that was just painted green on the outside to look like a monopoly, you know, exactly like the monopoly piece when you buy a house. So it tied the project into uh, a whole history of architecture in a way, and the way that that architecture had become embedded in our, in our popular culture, in our daily lives, in a way that we never think about. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. It was a great panel. Can I respond to that? Yes, of course. Um, it just so happens that uh, last week I landed a funder who is going to fund a four-year project on uh, women filmmaker, filmmakers, independent filmmakers, and uh, women who worked in television, of which there are many. And one reason we wanted to do this, this is a real political topic, because if you look at the, the employment figures in Hollywood, uh, you will see it's, it's, it's a scandal. I mean, not only uh, filmmakers of color are totally underrepresented as far as their, uh, their numbers in the population, but so are women. I mean, nowadays, probably 50% of all um, filmmakers coming out of film school are women, and yet in Hollywood the percentages are down around 10 to 12 percent. And so this project is being funded in order to, because we are literally at Hollywood's doorstep, to, to try to advocate that you know, there is a long tradition and, uh, uh, of women filmmakers and that they need to be working a lot more. That's great. Uh, any other questions? Ah, here we go. Hi. Um, this is a question for anybody, though I'd be interested, Chris, to hear UCLA's position. Um, from a technical standpoint, a film archive is becoming more and more challenging every year as more and more standards, like you say, disappear. So in terms of moving forward, what's it look like? Is, is 35 still king? Do we still transfer everything else to digital and just keep our eye on the button and see what it's going to next? Or... Um, how do we keep it so that we don't end up with another archive that we can't play? Good question. Um, the, the, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, just people that really are not involved in the field think, well, you know, everything's already been digitized and is available on Netflix, right? Um, well, no. Uh, actually, digitization is still a very expensive process. So nonprofit archives like UCLA uh, are challenged just in terms of, of doing the digitization. But more importantly, while uh, the digital is now, it's a simple fact, is the medium of choice for access and for projection. You know, mo all the studios are now going to be only making digital versions of their films for the theaters. But in terms of preservation, uh, we uh, were in a very serious situation with the digital because digital formats are changing every 18 months to three years, and these digital formats are not compatible with each other. And so when you have 350,000 titles, which means we probably have um, in excess of half a million actual elements, to digitize those and then have to do it every five years again is just not economically feasible, especially when analog film, 35 millimeter film or even 16, if it's stored properly, we know will last 500 to 1,000 years. So what do you want? Do you want to keep it on digital and keep transferring it or put it on, on film? So we're still, as a preservation medium, still wanting to, to keep film alive. Of course, the big problem is the manufacturers of film material and the labs, because they are, uh, the last lab is now clo closed in Los Angeles, Deluxe. And so we have now built our, we have built an analog lab that we are opening this year. And it, I mean, we actually had a lab before that, but we, we're, we've, uh, we're moving to a new building and we will have a digital and an analog lab there to do the work. And everyone is just, hoping and praying that the, there will be manufacturers making film, but we're already looking at the possibility that all of the, uh, within FIAF, the International Federation of Film Archives, of which Sylvia is also a, a member, uh, and, and, and TIFF, um, at, at possibly funding 
the actual production of film sometime in the future because we cannot do without it because I don't think this digital problem is going to be solved in the short term. In the long term, it will. In the long term, I'm sure the technology will evolve and we'll figure out a way to either you know, put it on lasers or something else. But, but all digital material is put on plastic and that plastic has an extremely short half-life. Mm -hmm. So it's not really feasible as a digital medium as a preservation medium. Thank you, Chris. I think we have time for one more question. Um, thank you all for your presentations today. Um, I just wanted to ask a bit about uh, the role of um, copyright and permissions for utilizing some of the, for people who might want to look at, you know, incorporating archives or historical kind of uh, records into their projects. What are some of the challenges with, with gaining permission or copyright to utilize some of these materials in your projects? <coughs> well, first I wanted to say uh, to Chris that I was the last filmmaker to actually order a 35 millimeter element from UCLA for grass. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, um, and now it's a lot less expensive and the access is, and there's a lot more that um, we c I can consider. Um, in terms of um, rights, um, UCLA, for example, has um, published rates, um, f and the most institutions do, and you would pay a stock footage license to incorporate uh, for uh, use in in um, in your work, um, in your documentary or wh whatever it is, um, and. There's a there's a kind of um, there's a censorship. Uh, they may not want to be involved with your project. Um, there's you know you all you you have to license um, copyright, and that copyright may have um, a series of third parties, uh, music, actors, um, so on, and not just access and accessing the master material plus the cost of transferring that material and cleaning it up, <coughs> as we do um, with um, historical materials. Um, so for example, I was denied um, music, um, uh, and I've been, <laughs> yeah, I'll give you an example of a, uh, there was a song called um, Dancing Dinosaur by Chubby Checker that I wanted a license. It was Chubby's first song. And Abco, the company who owned those rights, said that I couldn't license this. But I had this footage that of Chubby um, lip syncing to this song. And it was important for me to um, have this song because it was, it w was telling the story of his career. And so I sent the, um, the, uh, the person on the other end of the phone um, a, do a dozen roses for 12 weeks <laughs> <laughs> every Friday. Ron, you never at sent me any roses. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, she said, enough already. You can have the song. People think we're, we're having an affair. <laughs> and so I got it. I mean, you just have to be really, really persistent. Um, but there is, you know, some people, especially on the, the pot film that I did, it was like really hard. Um, I remember I couldn't get the song T for two, <laughs> um, which I wanted to use. Um, in, in Altman, um, a lot of the material is owned by the estate. If it was owned by stock footage companies, I would pay for it. And in some cases, it would be fair use. And we engaged a fair use lawyer to make sure that we um, we were okay. Yeah, and I, I would I would just um, say that uh, most of the archives uh, that I engage with are not in high demand. And um, uh, the, actually, with the Expo sixty seven project, we have a public uh, component right now, an exhibition component. We found um, eleven uh, prints of uh, Graham Ferguson's Polar Life. It was an eleven-screen uh, project, and we found it in in an archive that 
had told us they didn't have it, which was the Cinémathèque Québécoise, and then Jean Gagnon was hired there, and we asked him to look again, and we found it, and so it's now on show at the Cinémathèque, so that obviously was not a problem, but the one problem that we have had um, is with Disney, so that's no surprise. Surprise, surprise. Um, our last question is oh. going to be Teresa. Oh. <laughs> I just was wondering, we have, um, we have filmmakers, we have curators, we have archivists, we have professors on stage. We have very much the same in the audience. If any of you have tips for ways that we could advocate for each other. So like as a faculty member, how can you advocate for your local archive or your school's library? Or as an archivist, you know, how would you be, you know, how, how can we advocate for each other? What are steps, is there anything that we can do to help strengthen each other's, um, each other's roles and, and, you know, in the kind of life cycle of making sure that the preservation and exhibition of, of our heritage, of our art? Um. Back to the question of the digital, of course, digital as an access medium is the medium of choice now. So I see the archive morphing from a literally a space with an, uh, an archivist at the front door that allows you in or not to a virtual space. And that the archive of the future will be online and it will be a virtual space where anyone can go in and explore things. And we're starting to move in that direction. We, uh, this week, are putting online a massive collection um, called In the Life. This was a LBGT uh, magazine, the first in New York, founded in 1990, when uh, was, uh, was um, broadcast until 2011. And the producers came to us and said, you know, the, this show is incredibly important in terms of LBGT history uh, uh, because it documented things that, you know, were when, when American te television really, gays were still completely invisible. And we want to have that this program have an afterlife. And so they helped us fund getting this online. And so now uh, we will have all of the shows online, and but we're also in future planning to put all of the, uh, a lot of the outtakes and a lot of the long interviews which were not on the show, and so that, so that this material will be available for free for anyone to use, and, uh, and that's the direction we're really moving in, so that, so you don't need to come into the archives, that this material will be available for research or for whatever purposes, so that's, that's what we're trying to do. I've got something to say. Um, I think you need to lobby um, the Heritage Canada for more money that would be allocated to institute preservation institutions. It's appalling that the National Archives are not even taking historical materials anymore. They don't have time. The, there's the Budge Crawley collection hasn't even been organized. I, it's, it's just absolutely appalling that... Um, that there is no money for libraries that are preserving our culture. And I, don't, I'm, I do my little bit. Right now, there, was, there used to be a program that allowed for um, donors to receive some kind of benefit for, in, for, um, for gifting their collection. That incentive is now gone. They've also come down on the National Appraisal Board in terms of their methodology of appraising the, these collections so that they're valueless. And so there's no, there's no more incentive. So that's what needs to, in my mind, that's what needs to be proactively done in terms of the, that community. Um, and if somebody can <laughs> help, that would be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate that the situation in Canada is dire. Um, you know, the federal government, I'm, I'm not going to be political here, but there have been major cuts to all of our archives, Library and Archives Canada is limping. Um, smaller archives are, are in trouble. And the transition to the digital, as Chris said, um, actually raises more problems um, than it solves for archives. Yes, eventually down the road, it, we'll, we'll figure it out. But I think there's a European um, 
report, the European Commission report that just came out, that digital material will not last longer than 20 years. Analog material is in a much better um, situation. So I think there needs to be uh, partnerships uh, between uh, universities um, and a variety of different cultural organizations. I applaud TIF for this, um, for this forum. I think it's excellent. Um, people are excited by archives. Uh, ev people are working with archives more and more, but we need to raise public awareness. Um, we need to let the public know that our archives, our audiovisual heritage in Canada is, in, is at severe uh, risk. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like we could go on forever. This has been great. I feel like we're just, you know, warming up here. But we have to make it a wrap, unfortunately. So um, I just want to remind you, our next event is March the 6th. We're going to have a media archivist, Christina Stewart, talk about uh, film as a material and film handling. I hope you can join us for that. It will also be live streamed, and it will show up on our Higher Learning Digital Hub. And to stay up to date, go to TIFF, TIFFnet Higher Learning. And I s really want to thank these panelists. Um, it's just been fabulous. <laughs> and um, I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And it's, it's just great to hear people really um, advocating for archives. They're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.